monsters from the basement.
the, the rental houses had Hollywood really bad. Really bad, really bad. They dropped the ball. I was getting away from them. Uh, so nobody shoots in Hollywood anymore. You know, they don't have to use those cameras anymore. You know, high definition <coughs> video and all that stuff. You know, and you can actually shoot on a high def digital video camera and shoot 24 frames per second and make it look like film. And you can buy a package with all the bells and whistles and the, you know, the lensing and all that stuff for less than thirty thousand dollars. Really, really nice. You know, so <coughs> independent filmmakers break away from the, you know, the grip that Hollywood uh, had on them for so many, 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 many years. But that that was the way Hollywood was set up. They wanted to keep all the fucking money. You know, and when I used to do TV commercials in Chicago back in the, I was a lighting guy. Chicago back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and, and then, you know, which was 20-something years ago, or 30-something, help me out there, 30-something years ago, a uh, Panaflex silver package, 35 million years ago, cost 700-something dollars a day to rent. And then uh, developing the, the bump stock, you know, I don't know how much that costs. And, so the good thing about uh, high definition uh, or digital is that the filmmakers can afford to get their films made. The downside of that is that no talent, fucking idiots, can also <laughs> afford to get their films made. So you know, got that right. That right. There's sort of a yin and yang to it. Yeah, exactly. It's like I'm a filmmaker. Yeah, the, the cream rises to the top. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, yeah, ideally it does, but there's always a few that slip through the crack. Um, you know, so that's a discussion for an entire other day. But I, you know, I get approached a lot. If I'm rambling and you guys want to start the phone, it's okay. If you got any questions, please feel free to ask. How'd you get how'd you get the role? How'd you had talk about how you started? Uh, well, I auditioned uh, several times. My brother-in-law wrote it. <laughs> Kim Hankel was married to my sister. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah. How was Toby part with? It's enigmatic. He says, but he was fine. He was fine. But Toby, uh, they sort of co-directed the film. They co-produced. Toby was essentially... <laughs> now, that's what I remember, this was 40 years ago, but how I recall the experience was 40 fucking years. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> um, I my life go. Uh, um, Kim kind of handled the actors, you know, from the acting standpoint, and Toby was on top of the camera. You know, we had uh, Daniel Pearl, who was a marvelous, who was, as I was going to say, he, he had, he, he was a marvelous young uh, cinematographer, director of photography, and uh, grew into a very talented older DP. And his huge claim to fame was he directed the <coughs> thriller video, Michael. And that's him, that's his work. Um, and he still continues to do the work. But they were just head to head all the time. And they argued a lot. You get artists like that together, they have really strong opinions and, and shit happens. And then and Kim was more the script guy. This is what we're looking for here. This is this, you know, try it this way. And he was constantly, re, you know, well, he's probably right. He was constantly rewriting, uh, tearing off a piece of the legal sheet and saying, try it this way. Yeah. But we were all young, and, and uh, see, all the actors were actors. All the the film people were film people. You know, we were all educated, experienced, all that sort of thing. It wasn't like you know getting all your best friends together. You know, I'm gonna make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, slap some makeup on the dog and shoot in the backyard. You know, it, it wasn't that way. It was done in a very professional manner. I what? <laughs> nah, there's a the floor space. There's a seat over here. Over here. There's, there's one over here. Yeah, Robert, come sit. <coughs> ah, 
Yes. One in the balcony and one so in the front. So tell us some kind of funny, <laughs> crazy story that we hadn't heard before. Something about like how hot it was or working conditions. Yeah, it was fucking hot. I mean, that was. How bad it was. Texas in July and August. It, uh, it was miserable. Absolutely miserable. And then uh, with the makeup and the car, you know, I was in liquid latex. It wasn't a mask. I couldn't take it off. Fucking glued to my face with spirit, <laughs> you know, and a wool suit, starch shirt, pack, leather shoes, socks, and uh, there was no AC. We had a, a an old uh, Winnebago kind of thingy that had sort of a window area unit that we used for costumes and makeup, and you could go in there and kind of get cool, but it wasn't really very cool. Might have been true. cool looking, but <laughs> I mean, just to drive down the road. Well, I'm not far out. I wish I had one of them. Who's the city of the road? But I'm digressing, aren't I? <laughs> but, um, how, long the, how long was the shoot? How many days? Yep. I think it was maybe four to six weeks. <coughs> A few weeks. Dinner scene alone was like 26 hours, right? Dinner scene was... <laughs> yeah, it was pretty tough. It was well over 24. And it took him seven hours to put my makeup. Well, that day it took him five hours. <coughs> so I was probably over 30 hours. That was due to and it didn't want to come off. I mean, it looked like it appeared to my head. They only had three faces for you, and that's two. why they were so long. They may have three, but they used two. Uh, they had to get me out of there, and they had to, uh, Jim Cedow had to go home. Uh, you know, we were running behind, which is just really typical. Of, you know, just, you're always behind. Third day of shooting, you're two weeks behind schedule. Right. Uh, yeah, how's that happen? <laughs> I saw that uh, the old house is now a restaurant. So it it has been. I, I, the last time I heard, which was just a few months ago, is it's been torn down. But, uh, oh, really? it's, it, it's it moved. They actually moved the house, you know, several miles down the road. Uh, okay. it, it was a and b and that was a barbecue restaurant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd love to see it. Fresh cut. Uh, but it's not the same place. Uh, I think there's maybe like a strip mall or something. <laughs> but see, that was, you know, it's urban sprawl anywhere, but Austin was growing so much. That was, it was a bee. That was way out of the country. It was a good half an hour or more drive from from uh, Austin out. And Austin's grown in you know, suburban sprawl. I took that. Right but they were old ranch roads and farm roads. We should actually call them that yeah. in Texas. RR103. Mm -hmm. like, railroad? No, ranch road. So did you see it for the first time in the drive in? I saw it for the first time at the Chicago Theater on State Street in Chicago, Illinois. It was an audience. Yeah. Uh, what was the reaction? Yeah, very high. Hey, baby. Uh, <laughs> that's a wearing. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the reaction was mixed. Uh, we had gone as a group, and we actually had a party, an opening night party at a friend of mine's house. With pictures of Bloody Mary. <laughs> Punch bowl, a big punch bowl filled with Bloody Mary, decorated by stuff. But uh, so there were about 15 of us that went as a group, and it was a pretty full house. And well, the scene where y'all have, well, you know, but the scene where I'm sure you've seen the photo where Terry McMinn gets hung on the roof. <coughs> about at least 25 percent of the audience is there. What? <laughs> yeah, I, I was so Terry, she got a, got a walking ovation. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's it. I'm out of here. And really, it's pretty tame compared to what has come along, you know, since then. There's but not a lot of blood. There really is not a lot of blood in this film. But compared to what people have seen at that point, yeah, though, it, it was, was pretty shocking. Yeah. 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 Just the way the tension is built. And it's, a, it's a really a nice, every time I see it, I think, you know, we did pretty fucking well. For a bunch of, a bunch of young people that really never made a feature film before. Uh, 
Must have really. All the actors came from the theater background. There was only a couple <coughs> actors that had ever done it. Um, and that was the whole of the Balkan theater. Which was one of the most fascinating things to me because at the time I thought the film is where the money hit. Well, there's no money anywhere in acting, so fuck that. <laughs> but <laughs> at the time I thought, yeah! Yeah, I can make a living in the theater, <laughs> but to get the big bucks, I got to go into film. <laughs> hey, John. Yeah. Go you, maybe you want to share it with him. Maybe you won't. Uh, tell him just a little bit about your audition phase in Hollywood when you're hanging out the bar waiting for that different color phone to ring. Oh. God. <laughs> because everybody here has got cell phones, but back then, your agent yeah, had to call a number and it was a bar that had a phone. I moved to Los Angeles in 76. Uh, but uh, a whole bunch of us from Chainsaw started drifting out to L.A. And uh, Los Angeles in the 70s was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, <coughs> you had this was before cell phones, and also, so you, you'd have a an answering service where if you weren't home, if your phone rang more than like four times, a live person actually picked up the phone, and then you could go to a pay phone or wherever you happen to be and call your answering service to tell you if they had any messages. And that was a joint you're talking about. The rain, there's a place called the Rain Check Room, which is no longer there on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood, which was a actors' hangout. In the middle of the afternoon, it'd just be jammed with actors <laughs> drinking. And there were three phones on the wall with no dials on them. You know, like the old house phones in hotels. You know, wall phones with no dials. They probably don't. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they may not. We know. We know. Uh, you know, the phone would ring behind the bar, and uh, so you know, I, you could say, "I'm going to be at this number," and your answer in service would call the fucking rain check. <laughs> you know, the bartender Jimmy Fields. I still remember his name. Uh, would answer the phone and say, "Like Dugan, brown phone. It's your answering uh. service." <laughs> <laughs> And find out if anybody called you for an audition or any of that stuff. And there were, uh, I used to hang out a lot with John, John Larry Cat, who was a regular in there. Back when he used to drink. Boy, he used to drink. Of course, I did too. But, um, uh, <laughs> but, um, I was going to say, oh, the thing about Larry Cat is he, if you watch and listen, he does the voiceover in the beginning of this. Yeah. You know, the whole, you know, this is the story about <laughs> And I had, I knew him. I hung out with him for like a year or so before I ended up leaving L.A. and going back to Chicago. And uh, he knew that I was Grandpa in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I did not know that he did the voiceover. And he never fucking told me. <laughs> I didn't find out until years later that the John Larry cat that I knew and hung out with. You think you assumed it, maybe? I, you know what? I think he may have been embarrassed to tell me. <laughs> I think he had bigger and better things in mind. And he was on a show called uh, Baba Black Sheep at the time. <coughs> then turned into the Black Sheep Squadron. I got a really funny story about it. Yeah. <laughs> he used to have Bob Black Sheep, and there was like two seasons of that, and then it was dropped by whatever network he was with. They changed the name of it to Black Sheep Squadron, and uh, some other network picked it up. So he got called down to the studio to, to sign a contract for like 32 weeks on that show. And these were all young, it was... Robert Conrad played Pappy Boynton, who was this, you know, colonel. He's got this young hotshot spider group in World War II. And Conrad 
I always couldn't stand the young actress because he felt like he could take the job seriously. He went out in the trailers and drank and smoked dope and all that stuff. Which they probably did. But, um, so, <laughs> Larry King is, and he, he never got along with Conrad. He gets called in to sign, he goes over the contract, he signs it. 32 weeks of like $1,200 a week, which was a shit pot of money for a young actor back in the 70s. As he's leaving, there's Robert Conrad in an empty silent stage, stripped to the waist, working out on a heavy bag. Conrad's a real fucking macho dude. Well, the cat stops and goes, hey, Bob! You know, he stops boxing on this thing. Remember, you're not a real man until you've sucked a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Conrad had him fired, <laughs> so he got. They had to buy out his contract, so he got paid like thirty-five thousand dollars, and that's the work of fucking. <laughs> 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 and that's <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, it's two questions now, I guess. First, uh, what do you think of Chainsaw 3D? And uh, is it love it? I was in it for Christ's sake. Oh yeah. And uh, <laughs> the, the lyric can actually get paid in weed for doing the voiceover. I read that somewhere. I highly doubt that. <laughs> but, uh, who knows? I don't know. He was a disc jockey in uh, Baton Rouge, or Lafayette, mm -hmm. Louisiana. Somewhere between New Orleans and Houston, you know, that, that stretch. Area. South. Uh, I don't know, I'd kind of like to know that. But I, I, that would surprise me. Yeah. Because, uh, I don't know. Where did you hear that? Well, it's, it's actually posted on the facts on IMDb of all places. <laughs> I've read it on various message boards, just talking fucking really? shit. Yeah. On the internet. Uh, yeah, I don't know how true it is. That's not true. That would be true. Probably something that Larry Kent made up. Well, everyone I've asked that could possibly might know has always left it kind of open, like, well, it could be. No well, no, it could be, but. Yeah. Uh, See? Uh, That's pretty good. <coughs> Speaking as a young actor, as I, uh, as, as, you know, how I felt as a young actor, I would much rather have cash than pot. Yeah. I could get pot anywhere. Cash was already come by. You know? I mean, it was everything. It was virtually everything. How was the relationship between the, uh, you know, the younger actors and Jim and Dow? Uh, Jim was... Uh, uh, <coughs> Wow. He was, uh, I just looked up for him so much, but he was really serious and kind of, I was just in awe, and I thank everybody for him, because he was so experienced and so good, and he, and he took it very seriously. There wasn't a lot of time him just standing around bullshitting between setups. He was sitting in a chair over there with a script and laughing with a pencil, taking notes, coming up with ideas. Uh, he had a daughter about my age. <laughs> 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 Somewhere. Yeah, she was out on set one day, and I was working as a, a that day I was working as a production assistant. I, I was there all the time, whether I was acting or not. And uh, I was probably helping out with props or something. And uh, I was like, <laughs> Jim saw me. I didn't know his daughter, you know. He was like, Dip. Was she hotter than Marilyn Burr? That's like she was hot. As hot as. <laughs> and Terry, I, I lusted after all. I was 20 years old. I was like, oh. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. But he caught the look and was like, that's my daughter. She, you know, she's beautiful. Stay away from her. Yes, sir. <coughs> what was your audition like? What's that? Your audition. What you... My audition? I didn't audition. <laughs> my brother-in-law wrote it. I don't know if you caught that. Kim Hankel was married to my sister. I was doing a children's play in the Goodman Theater in Chicago entitled The Terradiddle Tales. <laughs> it was the summer of 73. Two shows a day, six days a week, like 125 bucks. It was like a $10 show. 
wearing tights and dancing around, <laughs> singing and dancing, and doing fairy tales from around the world. And Kim called and asked, Hey, John, man, are you crazy? I said, Sure. You know, Kim, of course. Why? Because I got something I wanted to do. He told me about it. I went. Uh, that day I talked with producer Bella Itkin. Somebody brought this up yeah, earlier. Yeah. 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 Bella Itkin was this old Russian woman, a uh, theater professor who was producing this children's play for the summer. She had one weird fucking eye that went up. Uh, <laughs> she'd yell at somebody like, she yelled at me. One eye. One eye. She's dead now, so I can make it seem much funner. She's been dead for years. One eye that went out this way, and there was always some sort of like goop like running out of it. <laughs> well, she had this Russian accent, and I told her I was putting in my notice because I was going to do, do a film. She asked what the role was, and I told her about playing Grandpa, and she said, and she was really upset. She said that she said Roddy McDowell would never have done Planet of the Apes if he had not been an established actor first. <laughs> and then I uh, saw so I went to Texas. So it was the summer was I started out dancing around in tights entertaining children and then like a month later I hit the chick over the head with a sledgehammer. <laughs> both paid for both. <laughs> Which also entertains children. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Probably more than the dancing around in tights. <laughs> Do you have any idea you'd be sitting here 40 years later talking about No, good God, no. <laughs> I, I remember going to see the dailies one night, and we'd watch them on an old steam back, if anybody's a filmmaker, an old editing table. We'd watch the, the, the stuff that came back from the lab from the day before. We'd watch them on a steam back machine in an editing suite someplace down by the University of Texas. And uh, Toby got up and he was he was taking like gaffer's tape and taping off the screen about an inch on each side. I said, Toby, why are you doing that? He goes, I want I want to see how this looks when it gets on TV. And I just went. Oh my god! He's like, what? This fucking thing's never gonna be on TV. <laughs> and now it's wow. on TV all the time. Yeah. So, you know, we had no idea. Toby did. He always had faith. Mm -hmm. You know, but we were like. <laughs> and then the first time I saw it in a movie theater with an audience, I thought, wow. 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 It wouldn't have mattered or not to me. I mean, we were making a movie. We were young and we were making a movie. It was great. Should we roll on this thing? We run. Uh, yeah.
medieval torture device. It's terrible. <laughs> just terrible. Silicone mm -hmm. is like a, it's just, it's like a second skin. Yeah. It's just absolutely marvelous. Plus, they've come up with some stuff to keep you from sweating on anything. It's an antiperspirant. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. but some like designer mm -hmm. antiperspirant, they hosed me down with it. Because a, a good deal of the discomfort comes from perspiring underneath the makeup. Because you can't fucking. Mm -hmm. ah! right. Yeah, you got sweat. Yeah. Oh, so, and this stuff was great. And we're shooting in Shreveport, Louisiana, mm -hmm. in fucking August. It was a, my second day on set there, my, or my first day, it was 103 degrees at 10.30 in the fucking morning. You know, I, and I'm in makeup costume, and I look at Carl Mastone, producer, I said, what the fuck is with you people? Have you ever heard of autumn or anything? You know, why do you constantly do this shit? You know, again, miserable, but I had an air conditioner. And really good food. <laughs> like really nice looking young production assistant saying, What's to do in here? Get you. Well, the food was good. And, and a big difference. The original, yeah, the makeup was way more comfortable. The original, that was like a plastic surgery. Uh, yeah, he did, he, he did the makeup. Uh, Charles Barnes, Dr. Barnes. Plastic surgeon at the top for a sculptor of hair. Good looking young, stinking fucking ridges on the He had his house up in the hills out there, not, not far from the university. As you go across the, the creek, there's a bar and spring water. Up in the hills up there. And he had his house. Beautiful concrete tile swimming pool in the back. The master bedroom suite. He, he was real fun. I showed the whole thing. And uh, next to his bed was a sliding glass door and a wooden platform. Press the head of the floor. Second floor. You roll out of bed. <laughs> Isn't that great? I thought one day I'm going to have one of these motherfuckers. Of That's okay. I want mine. Monsters from the basement.